It is my pleasure to moderate tonight's debate and exchange with the goal of engaging in meaningful conversation, civil debate, and elevated public discourse. Now, the primary election will be held for this special election on September the 5th. The adjusted election schedule impacts the entire state, not just those living within the 2nd Congressional District. However, only registered voters in CD2 are able to vote in the special election to pick Representative Stewart's successor. All voters can cast their ballots for their respective municipal election. Now, as a reminder, important dates to remember, September 5th is the date of the municipal and special primaries. The last day to register online to vote in the primary is August 25th. Everyone can register to vote on election day at polling locations, and the municipal and special general elections will be held November 21st. All three candidates who will appear on the Republican primary ballot were invited to appear tonight. Celeste Malloy and Bruce Huff chose to make the effort to engage in the public debate being broadcast here on KSL TV and live on KSL News Radio. We're grateful to have both of you here tonight for this crucial conversation. Now, the format for tonight's debate is as follows. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to respond to the questions, along with the opportunity for 30 seconds of rebuttal time. At my discretion, I may pose follow-up questions as we go along. We had a random drawing held prior to the debate to determine that Celeste Malloy will get the initial response in the opening questions. Uh, we'll then move back and forth on the remaining questions throughout the debate tonight. And so let's begin. Celeste, we'll give you two minutes for an opening statement. Thank you. I'm Celeste Malloy. I'm excited to be here tonight. Um, thank you, KSL, for hosting this debate. I grew up surrounded by public land and by people who depend on natural resources to make a living. And in that environment, I absorbed the attitude that the federal government could do whatever it wanted, and there was nothing people like us could do about it. I grew up and went to Southern Utah University. I got a degree in agriculture, and then I moved to Beaver, and I was working with farmers. I was helping farmers. And I really loved the work, but the longer I did it, the more I noticed that I, I was once again working with people who are dependent on natural resources to make a living. And again, they felt like the government policy on land and water that controlled their lives was something that they couldn't do anything about. So I made a decision to try to get into a position to do something to change policy. And I went to law school at BYU. Since I graduated from law school, I've been a deputy county attorney in Washington County doing public lands work. I've been a policy expert for all of the counties in Utah. I've been a staff attorney at the Washington County Water Conservancy District. I've been a parliamentarian and then vice chair of the Washington County Republican Party. And I've learned through those experiences that the government not only shouldn't be able to do whatever it wants, but it can't do whatever it wants. And what it takes is people who know policy and stay involved. So for the last four years, I've been working for Congressman Stewart as his legal counsel, and I've learned from Congress how to fight those fights on behalf of people like me, people like the people I grew up with who don't want to see the federal government roll over them. Um, I want to be on the Natural Resources Committee and the Armed Services Committee. I'm an unapologetic pro-life conservative. I support the Second Amendment, and I'm pro-family, pro-work, pro-free enterprise, and that's why I think I'm qualified to represent this district. Thank you. Bruce Huff, your opening statement. Thank you. I am Bruce Huff. I'm running for Congress. And uh, again, thank you to KSL and, and thank you to Celeste. We've had a, a wonderful time crisscrossing the state and meeting with people and debating the issues. I grew up in a small town in Idaho. Uh, it was one of those places where as a young kid you could get on your bike and, and ride until dark. And uh, those were, were wonderful times. I, I spent time working on my grandfather's farm. I, I learned to uh, work hard there, bucking bales of hay and hilling potatoes and a variety of other chores. But uh, I also learned to work for my parents very, very specifically. Uh, between some of our fishing and hunting activities, uh, I was expected to earn my own way. Um, I can still remember buying my first pair of eyeglasses in the third grade. Uh, it cost me $50 and I took it out of my own savings account. Uh, this was a great uh, learning point in my life about the importance of hard work and, and earning your own way. The, the second thing I sort of learned from my parents, though, was this idea of uh, standing up for what you believe, that you sometimes it's important to fight for that which you have a great conviction over. And I was in the minority in my, my faith in that community. 
Um, and it was often times that I had that opportunity to, to stand up. The, uh, the third area uh, that I learned was that service was really the pathway to joy, and my parents were wonderful examples of that. And so uh, in my career, I really tried to ingrain those three principles. Hard work, where I've started businesses, I've been an entrepreneur, created jobs in this state, uh, and uh, been a disruptor. Uh, in other areas. I learned to fight uh, against federal overreach when we sued the FDA. And finally, the idea of serving as a city council person in the Republican Party and in many other uh, nonprofit organizations. And so tonight, I hope that I can earn your vote. Thank you very much. Thanks to both of you for those opening statements. And now we're going to dive in. And only because this is the Republican debate, uh, we'll start with the elephant in the room. And uh, as of today, the former president of the United States uh, is facing four different uh, indictments, uh, 91 different charges. Many in the Republican Party have said that this is a witch hunt or this is the weaponization of the Department of Justice. I want to get your perspective in terms of what are these things, what do they mean, and what should we be thinking about them as we move into a very crucial 2024 election cycle? And uh, Bruce Huff, first goes to you. Thank you. Uh, this is a, an interesting time in our history. This has never happened before. And I will say that uh, we have seen a, politiz uh, a when, uh, politicizing of uh, the DOJ and of other uh, three-letter agencies uh, in the last number of years. It's been very unfortunate. Here's the thing with what's happening right now and, and what should happen and what needs to happen going forward. And that is that uh, everyone should enter into this process with a presumption of innocence. Uh, number two, we should follow due process. And number three, uh, we should be very, very careful about uh, allowing the media and others to uh, make this uh, a point of differential between different political parties. What I mean by that very clearly is that everyone should be treated equal in this process. And I think a frustration that many people have in this country right now and why there's such division is because there hasn't been a fair application of the law. Because the rule of law should stand and it should be that which we point to in any of these cases. And so seriously, when we look at what's happened over the last several years with other members of, uh, who, have, who have run for office or were running for office and some of the things that have occurred, they just weren't treated the same way. They were given kid gloves compared to uh, really gloves of chain mail. And Celeste. I want to be really careful how I answer this question because I know you're asking me about this because I'm a candidate for Congress and we're talking about it for political reasons. But the lawyer in me also knows that if you're too quick to opine on a developing situation, you're probably going to end up looking stupid. So it, it appears right now that these indictments are probably politically motivated. I haven't seen all of the evidence. Um, and so the one thing that I feel comfortable saying right now is that we need to make sure that if this is brought to a trial, we have a fair and speedy trial. Um, the former president is currently a candidate in a race and a long and drawn out process is going to interfere with the political process. So we need to make sure that the legal process moves quickly and fairly so that it doesn't bleed into the political process. And look like we are a banana republic, third world country where we use prosecution and the law to keep people off the ballot or to change the outcome of an election. Um, I haven't had a chance to read all of the indictments in depth, but it does look like there's probably an element of criminalizing political speech and political speech is protected in this country. So let's stick with the presumption of innocence until proven guilty and watch the process play out, but it needs to be a fair process. And Bruce, 30 seconds for a follow-up. I, I, all I would say is that uh, we, we need to look at who is actually engaged in this process. I think having a special prosecutor is probably the right idea. The person they chose was probably the wrong idea. Uh, he had already shown leniency towards Hunter Biden. It seemed to be a very difficult uh, thing to put him in charge of that process. Uh, so I'm seeing that the DOJ actually needs some serious house cleaning, I think, in the future. And Celeste, 30-second response. 
<clears throat> well, you'd mentioned a weaponization, that there's a feeling that the federal government is being weaponized. And I get asked about that a lot on the campaign trail. I staffed Congressman Stewart on the select committee to investigate the weaponization of the federal government. And so I just want to remind people that that Congress is acting. Congress is looking into this. It isn't something that's just happening and nobody is reviewing it. And I think people need to be reminded of that right now because they feel hopeless in the face of federal processes. All right, next question. Now, now we'll get into the, the meat of uh, where the people of the 2nd Congressional District are. And Celeste, we'll start with you on this question. And that is that many Americans and many here in the state of Utah are feeling the, the impact, the devastation of inflation as they yeah. sit around the kitchen table. As you've traveled the 2nd Congressional District, what have you been hearing? What is the impact on Utah families? This is one of the top three things I talk to people about on the campaign trail. Um, inflation, federal spending, and government overreach. And I actually think all three of them are government overreach problems. We have the inflation we have because of actions of the federal government. We've passed huge spending bills that have pumped federal dollars into the economy and inflated the prices of things. We also have federal policy that's making life more expensive. Um, we were energy independent four years ago. We're not now because of executive actions. And when the price of fuel is high, the price of energy is high, and the price of food is high. And all of these things pile up on Utah's families to make it so paychecks don't go as far. It's a not very hidden tax on every Utah, but it hits the people the hardest who are the least able to afford it. And that's why government overreach is such a big issue, even outside of the context of natural resources, where I'm usually talking about it, because it impacts every single American and every single Utah in ways that aren't necessarily intuitive. Uh, I don't know that everybody connects federal energy policy to the difficulty in making ends meet at the end of the month, and yet it has an impact on our families. Bruce, your response. Inflation is simply defined too many dollars chasing too few goods. And we have had in this administration uh, spending programs that have been completely uh, just untenable. Uh, you, you know, when COVID began, there was probably a, a very legitimate reason, and I would have voted for uh, a, a spending bill that would provide relief. But the last two bills that have been passed by this Congress and, and promoted by the president uh, have been nothing more than an inflationary uh, action. Uh, this is costing the people of this state and, and all across the country, but right here at home, thousands of dollars less in in spending power. Well, you think about that, thousands less in spending power. Uh, that means you're getting less for your dollar. Uh, this has been uh, a, a real sticking point in terms of uh, what has happened in Congress and what we need to do. My number one uh, item is the federal debt. We have a $34 trillion federal debt and spending that's out of control and the most important thing we can do right now to help families in this state and everywhere is to slow that growth of government down to the point where we are actually paying down the federal debt. And so last 30 seconds. I agree with the point about the federal debt. Um, and the only way we're going to gain on our federal debt is if we have a strong economy. So inflation is making it so paychecks don't go as far. It's also making it so that we're losing ground on the interest that we owe on our debt. So we have to get our spending under control. We have to get our fiscal house in order. Um, and we have to address the inflation so that we can gain on the debt that we already owe. Otherwise, the inflation is going to grow to be bigger than the rest of our budget. Or sorry, the interest is going to grow to be better, bigger than the rest of our budget. And Bruce. Yeah, look, the, uh, the problem we have here is that when you take in $5 trillion last year for the government to operate, which is way too much money, by the way, and you spend six and a half trillion dollars, you basically have just added to your debt. And what we need to do is actually have a budget in Congress. This means not only should we spend only what we collect, but we should find ways to reduce what we're spending to give back more money to the people of the state. And I'm going to stay with this question for just one more 30 second response. And that is, okay. give us something specific uh, that you can Talk to the people of the 2nd Congressional District in terms of real economic relief. What's that role? And Celeste, you'll go first. 
This is not a 30 second question. <laughs> I'll talk really fast. Um, one thing I think we need to do is restore the checks and balances between the branches. The executive branch is way too strong. And the, the things I talked about, like energy policy that are making inflation worse, the Congress needs to act as a check on the executive branch agency and get that under control. And I do have a plan for that, but this is a 30 second question. And we've got to stop the big spending bills. And those are coming out of Congress. We have the power of the purse. Congress needs to stop passing huge spending bills. And Bruce. And this is where we need to actually uh, make good choices about who we elect as a president and who we elect in Congress. Uh, in, in the presidency, we have gone from $2 a gallon gas to $4 a gallon gas, and that's a direct result of executive orders from the president. We have one candidate in this race who voted for Joe Biden, and we have another candidate here, Celeste, who did not vote at all. Those choices have significant consequences on how this government is run and the inflation spiral that we're in right now. All right, and we're going to stay with some of this economics. Uh, following Labor Day, Congress will come back in session, uh, and they have th basically 30 days to do one of the few jobs outlined in the Constitution, that is fund the government. Uh, we anticipate they'll do what they've been doing and kick the can down the road with a continuing resolution of spending, which will probably kick it until just before the Christmas holiday, which means that whoever is elected to this position will likely be sworn in right before that battle to fund the government before Christmas uh, kicks in. And so we'll start with Bruce on this question. How will you approach that as a brand new member of Congress, probably only a few weeks into the job, dealing with that big spending and funding the government? If I disagree with what's being proposed, uh, I'm, not, uh, I'm not opposed to seeing the government take a, a little vacation. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, different than a debt ceiling vote, this is a vote that uh, the consequences are a little different and I think can be used as leverage to make sure that we're getting the right spending bill in place. We have to get down to the idea of doing budgets. As in the private sector, this is what I had to do. We created budgets, zero sum budgets. We weren't saying, oh, let's do last year's budget and add 4% like the federal government. We actually said no. We have to start with what do we actually need? What should we actually budget for? What's going to be in the best interest of all those stakeholders, whether they are customers or suppliers or the actual shareholders or our employees? What's in the best interest? And we're not doing that in Congress. We need to take that discipline that we have in the private sector, and we need to hit it hard in Congress. We need to go for a balanced budget. And yes, if it were to come about and, and we had a vote on a balanced budget amendment, 100%, I would vote for that. And so less. Congress controls the purse strings. You're right. This is one of the most important things that the legislative branch does. I was really excited this year when the House adopted rules that required separate votes on each of the 12 appropriations bills. I've got some experience working on the Appropriations Committee, and that is where the purse strings are controlled. Um, I, I still have hope that we're going to pass those appropriations bills and we're going to pass them with lower spending than we've had the last couple of years. Uh, if we don't, then we're going to have to make a decision. And, and the only correct decision is to pass a budget that's smaller than last year's budget. So whatever's on the floor needs to be spending cuts. And if there are no spending cuts, then I'm going to have to vote against it. And Bruce, 30 seconds. So back to my business experience. This is it's, it's a complete inverse of what happens in government. If I have a budget and I'm getting towards the end of the year and I haven't spent it all, if I'm in the government, I have to hurry up and spend it so that I can get a 4% increase the following year. If I'm in business, I'm incentivizing employees and managers to save the money and I'll provide a bonus if they spend less than we actually budgeted, assuming that we actually operate the business the way it should be operated. So we are in a completely different mode of operation. That's why I think business thinking, people who have been in the private sector, people who have had to balance budgets, not just every year, but every quarter, every month, you have to follow a plan and there is no plan we have continuing resolutions that continue ad infinitum all right and so last 30 seconds i don't know that bonusing out federal employees is a great idea what we need to do is pass a budget that matches the need and we need to pass a budget that's less than what we're taking in so congress needs to take its job 
seriously take the responsibility to look through agency budgets line by line and remove anything that isn't authorized in their statutory authority and that we can't afford. And that's how you make the budget match the needs so there is no race to spend money at the end of the year. Both of you mentioned the debt of the country, well over $31 trillion. Soon there'll be over a trillion a year in interest payment on that debt alone. I want to give each of you just 60 seconds uh, to go down uh, the recent downgrade in the credit of the United States from AAA to AA+. Uh, and Bruce, we'll start with you again. 60 seconds on the debt, the deficit, and this downgrade. What's the impact for the 2nd Congressional District? Uh, look, the downgrade is, is a serious issue. I think some people say, well, you know, look, they're one agency that did the downgrade. But, but just think about it. In the time that we're in this debate today, the federal debt has increased $100 million. It's a pretty good paycheck, Boyd, to be here for an hour. Okay? <laughs> so what do we do? Uh, we have to hold people accountable. Uh, look, Congress is the purse strings. That's our job. And we are basically saying to, to everyone at this stage, we need to focus on the things that we can actually do. Let's don't go for the Hail Mary every time, but there are a number of things that we can accomplish. Uh, for example, in the Department of Education, shouldn't exist anyway because it's not a constitutional, uh, uh, you know, mandated uh, entity, but we could certainly block grant and instead of all the money being rubbed off on administrative costs at the, at the uh, federal level, we can put it in school districts and locally for uh, people to uh, take care of. Uh, and Celeste, one minute. I think the downgrading is just an acknowledgement that we need to get our fiscal house in order. Um, the unfortunate side effect is the downgrading will make life more expensive when we're already dealing with inflation. We'll get uh, worse interest rates and that makes everything cost more. I think the answer is actually pretty simple and I think it's doable. Congress needs to go through every agency's budget and every agency's mission, look at the statutory authority that Congress gave that agency, compare it to what the agency's doing, and defund anything that's outside the statutory authority. It shows that we're ready to get our fiscal house in order, it saves money in the budget, it also helps address the federal overreach problem, and all of those things combined will show that we're ready to act like grown-ups about our budget and balance it, and that we're ready to have the proper balance between the branches of the federal government. The executive branch agencies and the executive branch in general are too powerful right now, and Congress, which is supposed to be in control of spending and are keeping our fiscal house in order, has yielded too much authority. It's time to take it back. We're going to shift to the international front now. Uh, recently, President Biden asked Congress for additional funding uh, for Ukraine in their defense against Russia's invasion of their sovereign territory. Some, including many Republicans, have started to complain or uh, criticize the financial support of Ukraine. I want to get your perspective of why should we be supporting Ukraine and what does that look like moving forward? And Celeste, we'll start with you. I've answered this question a lot of times. I've been really consistent in my answer. When Russia invaded its neighbor, I think it was really important that the rest of the world stood up and said that that was unacceptable. America still has a role to play on the world stage. We're still a shining city on a hill, and we need to act like a world superpower and set a standard for the rest of the world. We've been supportive of the Ukrainians in their fight, um, but now it's time to have a plan. I hope we've learned from other experiences we've had, getting involved in other conflicts, and we need to know what our mission is, when we've accomplished it, and how we're going to get out. We also need an accounting for every dollar and every piece of equipment that we've sent. Until we have that, we shouldn't be sending any more aid to Ukraine. And when we have that, we can use that information to make a decision about what, if anything, to send to Ukraine. But we need to have a plan and we need to have an accounting. Until we have that, we shouldn't even be having a conversation about sending anything else. And Bruce, your response. First of all, I would like to right now just say that if we could take some of that money and send it to Maui to kind of help out there, I think that would be a better use of our funds immediately. Um, we have a role, but here's the thing. We should never have boots on the ground. We should never have aircraft flying over Ukraine during this conflict. War is a horrific thing. Uh, Putin is a thug, and he should never have had any right to go into the into Ukraine and to challenge their sovereignty, especially after he guaranteed it in 1994. We have that role, but we have to also say, NATO, you have to step up. 
You agreed to do a 2% of GDP for decades. It's time to actually come up to that standard and to be the forefront of what's happening in Ukraine. That's the most important thing. No, no lives of Americans should ever be at risk in this. And we can provide intelligence and we can do a lot of other things, but Europe also has to stand firm on this and be the front line of this, uh, this action. All right, I actually want to shift just a little bit and, and uh, sneak in a question around Hill Air Force Base. And Bruce, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, obviously, Hill Air Force Base is critical to national security, also an important force here in the state of Utah. Uh, as a representative, part of the Utah delegation, what is your role uh, in securing Hill Air Force Base? Well, thanks for that, uh, Boyd. The, this is a, an area that's really important to me. Uh, first of all, we don't have anyone on the Armed Services Committee any, any longer. That would be my first priority. Uh, second, I serve as an honorary commander of the 388th, and I, w I just want to tell you and, and tell the audience this. If you don't understand what we have there, you need to. They are literally the tip of the spear. In any major international confrontation, they are the first in to secure those, those airways, those, th those skies. And I am so proud of them. They have done such a remarkable job in their deployment speed and their training and what they do. It's, it's militarily, it's an essential part of us being the world dominant power. We need to be that. We need to regain some of what's been lost in spending and, and reappropriate that. The second thing is it's an economic benefit to the state uh, and we should never say that it, one is a trade-off over the other, but we do have people who are employed here. We want to make sure that Hill Air Force st stays, uh, base stays a very vibrant and uh, a very fulfilling place for people to work who are both civilian and military. And its economic impact on the state is, is really unmatched, and including the, the testing range out uh, in Tooele and, uh, and also the Army Dugway, the proving grounds as well, very important. And so last. I've also said from the day I decided to run that I wanted to be on armed services. And I think this is a good example of how we do things well in Utah. Uh, within the delegation, we've done a good job of making sure that we get committee assignments that are good for Utah. And right now we don't have anybody on House Armed Services. Traditionally we have. With Congressman Stewart on defense appropriations, he can cover that gap. But when he resigns on September 15th, Utah will be vulnerable. And that's one of the reasons that I've consistently said I want to be on natural resources and I want to be on armed services. Hill Air Force Base is actually just outside of the 2nd District, but a lot of the people who work there live in the 2nd District, and it's an important installation to the state. And as my opponent mentioned, we have a lot of other important military installations that are in the district, including the Utah Test and Training Range, um, Dugway, the Twilla Depot, the Chemical Depot, um, and we have a lot of private industry in this state that is here because of those defense installations. So it's important that we make sure we have all of our ground covered and, and that somebody's on armed services to look out for Hill Air Force Base and the other installations and make sure that our private industry that's defense related stays healthy and vibrant in this state. We've now reached the halfway point of this debate featuring our candidates, uh, Bruce Huff and Celeste Malloy, who are running in this special GOP primary election in Congressional District Number 2 to replace Republican Chris Stewart. I'm Boyd Matheson from KSL Radio's Inside Sources and KSL TV's Sunday Edition, and we are going to continue the conversation. Uh, much has happened around the Supreme Court and some contentious decisions around the country. Uh, under Roe, uh, abortion was legal up to 24 weeks based on 1970s technology and medicine. The Supreme Court's Dobb decision, of course, overturned that, pushing those decisions back to the state. Uh, this created a lot of uncertainty for many women across the country as states tried to scramble to put laws in place. So what do you see as the correct conversation and the correct policy discussion when it comes to the lives of the yet to be born and women's rights? And uh, Bruce, we will start with you on this question. Thank you. Uh, first of all, as the father of 10 and 22 grandchildren, uh, need I say more, I am ardently uh, pro-life. This uh, Dobbs decision was rightly decided. Uh, Roe v. Wade was wrongly decided. And this isn't even necessarily about abortion per se. It is about the role of the federal government and the state government. Uh, I, am a, I am a, for federalism all the way, the, 
the ninth, tenth, and fourteenth amendments on on the enumerated powers are very important to me. Uh, the state rightly decided, or the court rightly decided, to push this back to the states. Now, I think that the states have a very important responsibility here to be very thoughtful about what they do and how they do it. But that's not a congressional issue. The congressional issue really is. Should it be a national issue or should it be a state issue? And I will defer to the state issue uh, every time. And Celeste. I, this is the 10th debate that we've done, and in nine of them, I've said I'm unapologetically pro-life, and, and I am. I'm willing to stand by that. I think as a female candidate, I have a unique voice in this debate. Um, and you asked about what the right question is. And I think the right question is, how do we protect life? Too often we get caught up in the number of weeks or how to define exceptions. Um, and what we really need to be focused on is how do we protect those who can't protect themselves? And that is the unborn. We need to be unapologetically pro-life. We can work out the details. Um, but the right question is how do we protect those who can't protect themselves? And I would like to see the states move on this, but as a federal representative, I'm never going to pass up an opportunity to sponsor legislation or vote for legislation that protects the rights of the unborn to be born. And Bruce, 30 seconds. Yeah, look, I think it's a, uh, the, the state of Utah has had a law for many, many years that, that seemed to work pretty well. Uh, I just think we have to be thoughtful about it. We have to be respectful. We have to uh, have that discussion. Uh, it is very easy to get caught up in the supposed science or religion. Uh, we, we also have to just be very careful about protecting the life of the mother as well and, and her health. Uh, as, as someone who has had a wife who has gone through this travail, it's very important. And so last 30 seconds. Yeah, it's an important point that the best way to protect life is to make sure that mothers have options. Um, we need to make sure that we have uh, programs in place and assistance for pregnant mothers so that Abortion isn't the easiest option. That bringing a child into this world is the easiest option. And that's, that also needs to be part of the conversation when we're talk to, talking about protecting life. Because the life of the mother is also paramount. America is a nation of immigrants, and we want to attack this in a couple of different lanes. We want to start first with illegal immigration and the southern border. And Celeste, we'll begin with you. What should our policy be? What is the state of immigration and illegal immigration at the southern border? I think the state of immigration at the southern border is a state of chaos. If you've been watching the news at all, you know that we do not have control of our southern border. I think we've had 5.5 million illegal crossings during this administration, and we don't know who or what is coming across our southern border. You can't be a sovereign nation if you don't have control over entry. We have to have control not just at the southern border, but also at our ports of who and what is coming into our country. That has to be the absolute first priority, um, and right now we're failing. I think we're failing all the way across the board on immigration because I think we're also failing at having a legal path to come in and legal visas, but I think that's probably your next question. So I'm going to stay focused on the so southern border. Right now the best technology I know of to secure the southern border is a wall. When we figure out something better than that, let's adopt that, but we have to have control of our border. And Bruce. We know that the southern border is a complete mess, and it's because we have this president who was elected just a couple of years ago. Uh, the number of, of illegal entries into this country has skyrocketed into the millions just over the last two years. There are some things we can do immediately, however, uh, to do that. We, we all know that where there's a, a, a barrier, uh, a wall, that it will help. Where that's possible, we should do that. But immediately, we can announce to the world that if you come into this country, other than through a legal port of entry, you are ineligible for asylum. End of story, go home. That's going to force people to say, okay, if I really feel like I have asylum as an option, I need to come through a port of entry. We should also, I think, move the, the magistrates and, and judges out of the DOJ and to the Border Patrol. And we should double, triple, or quadruple the number of judges so that we're not just doing the, the sort of catch and release activity that goes on. Come back for a court date in a few months because it's not going to happen. Because almost 80% of the asylum seekers actually do not qualify for asylum. 
So those are two things we can do literally almost overnight once I get into Congress. All right, and we're going to go to that second uh, part, and Celeste did uh, predict where we're headed, and that is legal immigration. Uh, we need talent. We need uh, people in the country, uh, especially here in the state of Utah, in the 2nd Congressional District. Bruce, we'll start with you, and let's just go one minute on this. Uh, what do we need to do to fix the very broken legal immigration system? Uh, look, we have our, our green card and, and uh, H-1 visas are a, a disaster. These, these go back to things that were settled in, like, 1990. We have quotas of 1990. It's a different world. We have uh, serious unemployment or employment issues where we do not have workers in the hospitality, construction, and agricultural area. We need more workers in this country. We need to do it legally. We need to open up that process so that we have a, a higher number and not this arbitrary 1990, you know, number that just, you know, is, is brought out of thin air. Uh, the second thing we need to do is we need to open up for skilled workers, especially those who have STEM training, those who have even gone to university here in this country, that we should provide opportunities for them to not only do it, even if there's a backlog, they should be allowed to stay. And not only that, but if they're getting a green card, their family should be able to do it as well so that we're not separating families in this situation. Celeste, one minute. I've taken meeting after meeting with Utah businesses that are dependent on visa workers and they can't get them. Um, and so I think the answer to this problem is actually fixing both of these things at the same time. We need to fix the border, we need to fix the visa program, and if we fix them together, I think we can get bipartisan support. And the good news about this is both of those solutions are good for Utah. Utahns want the border to be under control. We're all border states. If we have 5.5 million illegals coming across our southern border, that's a problem for Utah. And if we have businesses that can't get the visa workers they need, that's a problem for Utah. So solving both of these problems is a win-win for Utah, and I think it's the only way we're going to get it through Congress because that's what you're going to have to do to get bipartisan support. And then finally, let's talk about asylum uh, and those who do come here either as refugees. Utah has a very welcoming experience in bringing refugees in. Uh, we'll just take one minute on each. How should we be approaching those who are coming here uh, for asylum? And Celeste, we'll begin with you. I know that one of the things we have to do is make it so that people, we have to reinstate the stay in Mexico policy. If we let people in and then find out they're not eligible for asylum, it's a lot harder to get them back out. So while we're welcoming and we want to make sure people who are fleeing persecution have a safe place to come, which is the United States of America, we need to make sure that before anybody crosses our border, they are eligible for asylum. Otherwise, the system just gets abused. So we've got to make sure that people don't have incentives to come here illegally. Right now they do. We've got to remove the incentives, and one of those incentives is letting people come here while they have their asylum hearings. We need to make them stay in Mexico and decide if they're eligible for asylum before they cross the border. And Bruce, one minute. And I've answered the question on the southern border, so let me just switch it up just a little bit. You know, every month we're getting um, hundreds of, of refugees from countries like Afghanistan. Uh, where we had such a botched exit where the Biden administration, lit uh, administration literally just created a, a chaotic uh, exit from that country that cost the lives of servicemen uh, and servicewomen and many of our allies there. When they come here, we have one of the most welcoming uh, communities in the country. Uh, when I was uh, the president of the Boy Scouts of America here in the Great Salt Lake Council, we actually uh, worked with those communities to create um, scouting units that included young men and young women so that they could actually integrate into society here in a way that taught them about America and also gave them activities that kept them candidly out of uh, gangs. And so from an immigration standpoint, we welcome those who are absolutely persecuted, uh, but those 80% that don't qualify from the southern border, they can go home. You two have participated in a number of debates, over 10 by my count, uh, across the, each of the uh, counties uh, of this congressional district. You've taken questions not only from GOP officials, uh, but by my count, you've probably faced uh, over 200 questions from actual voters and constituents. Yeah, you're nothing, boy. <laughs> Those are the important questions, to be sure. Uh, and, we, and we do applaud both of you for restoring something that has been missing in our federal uh, congressional races. Is that rigorous? 
vigorous and regular debate. And so we do applaud you for that. Uh, the question I have for each of you is share with us one question that or comment you've received from one of your potential constituents that either surprised you or challenged you or informed you or made you think differently about an issue. And Bruce, we'll start with you. 60 seconds. Gee, thanks. Um, <laughs> I think uh, one that was sort of interesting to me is uh, when they sort of asked about, well, how, what makes you think you can make a difference? And, um, and I've thought a lot about that because being one of 435 is, is not an easy task. But, you know, being in business, uh, that's what I did. I worked not only within the, the, you know, the company with over 1,000 employees, but I also worked uh, with other organizations. And... And even with Congress on legislation, the idea is how do you get things done? And for me, the best way to do it is in a way that creates respect and civility. That's done by listening, uh, trying to really understand their, their values and their interests. And when they understand that you're interested in them enough to really understand them, it, it changes the trust dynamic. And when that trust dynamic is changed, then you can have a policy discussion without compromising your principles or your values. And Celeste? I thought it was a really good idea to have a debate in every county. Um, I knew that there were people who felt like they, were, they didn't have access to this process. But I have been surprised at how much it's meant to the people in the various counties that we've shown up. We've had debates in almost every county. A couple of the counties decided to combine with their neighbors just to make it easier for people to get there and to create a critical mass. But after every single debate, someone has come up and thanked me, and I'm sure Bruce has had this experience as well, um, and said, we've never had a debate in this county before. I've never been able to listen to the candidates before except on the news. And and we've had great turnouts. We've had bigger crowds at these than I expected. A lot of them have been streaming. We've had a lot of people watching them online or listening on the radio. And it surprised me how much the constituents have stepped up and participated and how much it's meant to them that we were there. Thanks to both of you. Uh, we live in a very divisive time when it comes to politics and political rhetoric. Uh, it's often been said that it's very easy to shout talking points at your enemies. Uh, it's a much harder thing to stand up and tell your friends that they might be wrong. Uh, so the question, and we'll start with you on this one, Celeste, what is something that you would tell your Republican Congress, uh, members of Congress, uh, when you get back to D.C.? Wow, that is a tough question. It is difficult to stand up and tell your friends when they're wrong. Um, I'm, I'm going to start answering this question by agreeing with the premise of the question. I've said this a lot in the last few weeks, but I think it's important. I'm never going to be a yeller. I'm never going to be a name caller. I'm never going to be a bomb thrower. Uh, when you know what you're talking about and you know what your principles are, you don't have to yell and call names in order to get your point across. So that's something that I am willing to commit to. It's something I have a lot of practice with. Um, and I've learned that people will forgive you for disagreeing with them, but they're not so quick to forgive you if you are a jerk to them. So being civil matters. Um, but one of the things that I think I'm going to have to stand and tell my own team they're wrong about is um, entitlement reform. It's something that nobody wants to touch. It's one of those third rails in politics. But I don't know anybody my age who thinks that Social Security or Medicare or Medicaid will be solvent for us. And we're going to have to make tough choices. We're going to have to walk into that political buzzsaw and we're going to have to solve it. And that's probably something that's going to be really difficult for people on both sides of the aisle to accept. If it was easy, we'd have already done it. But it's something that I am committed to doing. Bruce, message to your potential colleagues in Congress. So actually, for me, this isn't a hard question. This is really easy. Stop it. <laughs> Stop spending money. Uh, but, but seriously, and that is serious, by the way, uh, it really comes down to uh, making sure that people understand that you can't be intimidated, that you don't need anything from them. What you need is just their cooperation, their kindness, and their understanding of your values and your uh, principles. If they'll take that much and we'll work together on that, it'll work. It's sort of the, the Arthur Brooks uh, style of, of politics, um, uh, who, who authored the book, Love Your Enemies. We can do this. Right now in this country, we have great divisions. Uh, but the reality is, as I've studied it, 
it's really not the country, it's the extremes. And they're the loudest uh, voice out there. We need to bring it back and have the conversation in a way that is passionate, but is not a contentious or a contemptuous uh, dialogue. We can do this by being uh, in a conflict to come to a better solution. But we can do that conflict by focusing on solutions and being productive and respectful in that conflict. Focus always precedes success, especially in Congress, uh, because you can't do everything. And often strategy comes down to deciding what not to do as well as what to do. Uh, Bruce, we're going to start with you. We're going to project forward as if you were in Congress. Give us one thing that you will definitely do early on as a member of Congress and one thing you'll choose not to do. Let me start with the not to do. I will not stand up in front of the camera and say that I am going to accomplish this grandiose thing when I know very clearly that it's just not possible. Uh, Hail Mary passes are great for Jim McMahon, but candidly, uh, football's still a game of inches. And that's more of my style in finding and focusing on things that can get done. But what will I do in terms of a, a first uh, uh, policy or first legislative act? Uh, I have a couple of pet projects. One of them that I think is extraordinarily important. It relates to the, the border as well. Uh, 80,000 children have disappeared that have crossed the border without their legal guardians. Where are they? I can tell you where most people who are in the know think they are. They're in child sex trafficking. We have got to find a way to stop that. The border control is the number one way, but another way we can do it is create a greater deterrent. Right now, if you are convicted of child sex trafficking, your sentence could be from 14 to life. 14 years is way too low a bar. If it isn't at 25 or 50, or even maybe we started at life, but we need to do something right now about child sex trafficking, and it's something that we can do right away. And I think we can get bipartisan support for that as well. And we can do it at the border, but we can do it right here in this country where it happens literally in your neighborhoods. And we just need to get our hands around that problem. And Celeste, your response. Okay, I'm going to start with what I am going to do. I'm going to make sure that I'm on committees that are important to this district. I'm going to spend my time fighting federal government overreach. It's what I talk about. It's what I get excited about. I get really passionate when I talk about it because the structure of our Constitution is what makes sure our government is protecting the freedoms of the people. And in order to protect the freedoms of the people, our government is set up so that no branch is strong enough to violate people's freedoms. And right now, that's out of balance. So I want to be in the legislative branch, checking the executive branch, and making sure that people are getting the right amount of government, which right now they're getting way too much. Um, and the other thing that I will do is build relationships. What I'm not going to do is get involved in things that belong to the states. Federalism is important. The federal government's powers are limited and few, and it's really tempting, once you get in office, to think that your opinion on everything is important and that you need to get involved in every issue. I'm not going to do that. I've been really disciplined on the campaign trail, and I'm going to make sure that by my actions I show that I really do believe in federalism, in separation of powers, and in good representation where I show up for the issues that matter for the constituents in my district. Younger voters uh, continue to increase the percentage of eligible voters in the country, and yet the young people don't seem to really be particularly fond of either the Democrats or the Republicans. And uh, Celeste, we'll start with you. What is your message to younger voters and why they should engage in this process as a Republican? That's a great question. It's a question I got asked recently by college students in Cedar City, SUU students from my alma mater said, what are you going to do to get more young people involved? And I, I think the answer is, for me personally, I'm willing to show up. I'm willing to go talk to young people. I'm willing to share my story of how I got involved. I used to think it wasn't important. Now I know it is. Um, it wasn't that long ago that I was considered a young person. And, and I want to make sure they know there's a place for them in the party and in politics. I know it can be intimidating when you're in your 20s to show up at meetings and get yelled at by people who are your parents' age. And I think that's a big deterrent for young people to really get involved. And the path to getting them involved is one, addressing the things that matter to them. We have 
um, out of control spending, out of control inflation, those things are affecting people who are barely old enough to vote. They're the ones who are going to bear the brunt of these policies and making sure that they know that their voice is valuable. Instead of patting them on the head and acting like they're too young to know what's going on, um, we need to listen and invite them in and make sure that we're creating a space for the next generation because we're not going to be here forever. And Bruce, your message to the young people. Well, I was a young people once, uh, believe it or not. And as a young person, I made a decision. I researched a lot of different things. I, I remember researching religion and then politics. And in politics, I discovered something really interesting. That if you go to the source documents of this country, that it really informs you as to what we stand for as a country. And I think as we get young people more engaged in learning about this country from source documents, it's pretty exciting. It's not boring, it's actually invigorating. And as a young person, I made this decision very consciously. I wanted a party in America, start first with being an American, and then I wanted a party who would represent what I believed, uh, that would be things like limited uh, government uh, at every level, but especially at the federal government, since it's a construct of the states, not the other way around. And number two, that it protected individual freedoms. Uh, that was uh, very important. And, and finally, that we had a strong national offense, that, that there are certain aspects that need to be done on a, uh, on a national basis. Uh, interstate commerce and, and the national defense. So for me, it was a conscious decision as a young person. So for me, it's all about, let's have that conversation. Let's see what helps you get that house when interest rates are high, or how can we lower the interest rates so you can buy a house. And it's all under the Republican umbrella of a better America. Well, we've come to time for final conversations, final statements, and in your final statement, I'd like you to also address this issue of trust. We've stress tested this country under economic collapse, world wars, and pandemics. We've never stress tested the nation with a lack of trust, and trust in government and institutions is at an all-time low. And so as you give your final answer, help us understand what you'll do to help restore trust in government and in the institutions of America. And Bruce Huff, you get the first closing statement. Thank you very much, Boyd, and thank you again for this opportunity. You know, the first, uh, first law of the Scout Law is being trustworthy. Uh, that uh, is something that I have felt uh, in my being for many, many years as a young Cub Scout all the way up till now. Uh, being trustworthy is, is so important, whether it's in your marriage relationship, in your family. Uh, it has to also exist between you and your government. And there's been a tremendous amount of lack of trust uh, that has occurred because of the actions of some. We are in a situation where we need to elect someone to Congress who is trustworthy and who has the uh, ability to stay that way. Uh, I'm in a position in my life where there isn't anything that Washington has that I want or need. I'm there for one reason. The reason is to serve you. That's it, service to the community. It's that thing that my family brought up to me uh, and taught me as a, as a young child all the way till now. And service is one of the great privileges that we have. And I will tell you that it does lead to a joyful life. Uh, I just wanted to say that there's differences between us here. I spent a career in business where I have done the budgeting work. I have done the hard work. Uh, of creating jobs and helping families prosper in their own communities. Uh, I've done something that neither of my uh, opponents have done. I voted for Donald Trump in 2016 and 2020. And whether you like him or hate him, you have to look at that period of 2016 to 2020 and realize that those were important years. It got us a court, energy independence, and many other things. And I had the courage to vote for him two times. And I ask you to have the courage to vote for me tonight. Thank you. Celeste, final. I am an unlikely congressional candidate. I'm as aware of that as anybody else is. I am not wealthy. I'm not a perennial candidate. And I'm not from an important, powerful family. And I'll tell you why that should matter to you. Because I don't want this job because I think it will make me important 
or because I think it will make me impressive. I have been close to Congress before, and I've seen good representation, and I've seen not so good representation. And I know that when this job is done well, it's a lot of work, it requires taking a lot of criticism, and there's not a lot of glory to it. But I also know what it's like to feel like you're on the outside of the political process and that things are happening to you and that you don't have any say. Um, and I want to make sure that people in this district are represented by somebody who knows that. A few days after I won at state convention, I ran into a friend of mine from Penguich, who I've known since college, and he said, one of the reasons I'm so excited that you're doing this is because people like us think people like us can't do this. We just hope somebody else will do it and will care about the things we care about. Um, I'm here to make sure that people like us know that we can do it. The people who are dependent on natural resources to make a living know that the government can't just do whatever it wants to them. Um, I get asked a lot if I'm ready for this job, if I can handle the pressures of Washington, D.C. To that end, I have two endorsements that I'm really proud of, Congressman Stewart and Congressman Bishop, who have both served Utah with distinction, have both endorsed me. They know what the job requires. They know what those pressures are like. They both know me, and they know I'm ready to serve. I also have almost 70 endorsements from local elected officials who've worked with me who know I'm ready to serve. And so I'm not asking you to trust me because I say to trust me. I'm asking you to talk to the people who do know me, who've endorsed me, who trust me, because this district deserves to be represented by a conservative who lives in this district and I'm the only one in the race who fits that description. Thanks to both of you for joining us tonight. It's up to you now to vote. Thanks for watching and good night. Hey. It is so good to be back. Every morning, I let's make your to-do list. Everything you need to know before you head out the door. Your to-day list. Get the entire family organized. Healthy back-to-school yumminess. Every day needs today. After a car accident, never take the insurance company's first offer. Call us for your law. We've gotten our